So what we're going to do now is we are going to manage to make our way from discussing uh, Presbyterianism in Europe, Presbyterianism in Scotland. Uh, we talked about its developments uh, in the last few lectures, and we're going to transition to talking about uh, how that makes it onto a whole new continent, Christianity in America. But before we can get to that and the actual beginnings of Presbyterianism in this continent, we're going to have to talk about uh, theories of government, um, theories of the right of kings and leaders and magistrates of all kind to their authority, how that was given to them, and the theories about it especially developed by Presbyterian thinkers. Because frankly, um, these ideas are going to have vast ramifications on society up until the present. And in a sense, we are all children of um, a reformed worldview when it comes to uh, how government should function. And so we're going to start um, in Scotland, and we're going to start with the conflicts that begin to arise after the Westminster Assembly, after the English Civil War, when the crown is attempting to assert its rights over um, the, the British uh, Three Kingdoms and see what happens there. So let's, let's take a look at this timeline first. So we got James I, and we'll note later on in this lecture that it's in, uh, what, 1620? We'll see when, we, when I get that timeline up, that in fact, you know, the first, um, the first voyages to the, the Americas from the English are going to occur. But we're going way out to this period, um, following the Westminster Assembly to see how the story goes on over there in uh, Europe before we, we start talking about America. Charles I, of course, was the king who um, was king during the Long Parliament and the calling of the Westminster Assembly and the English Civil War. Well, um, what ends up happening is he, um, or at least the royalists, they end up being in control um, by the end of the Westminster Assembly. And we're going to see what they think about the conclusions of the Westminster Assembly. You're going to see that overall they completely get overturned in England. And so you have these incredible documents that get produced. We saw that when we talked about the Westminster Assembly last week, but they're never adopted in England. They're only adopted in Scotland. And what we're going to see is that Charles II, he finds himself with a rather difficult task. He, he's the monarch again. He's back on the royalist interpretation. He's always been the monarch, regardless of this brief period of the Commonwealth when Oliver Cromwell is uh, running the show. He's always been in charge on the royalist interpretation. And the question is going to be, how do we conceive of government? How do we conceive of the right of this man to be in charge of these kingdoms? Where did that come from? Did God give him that right? Did the people give him that right? How do we make sense of it? And then we're going to see as well in this period that it's a period of vast bloodshed, especially at the end as he is attempting to assert his supremacy and right, frankly, over the church, just as well as these kingdoms. And I think it's important for us to note, just looking at this timeline and anticipating what we're going to talk about, whatever sort of frustrations you currently have with the government, government overreach, you name it, we're going to see what that really looks like when we look at the period known as the killing time um, in, uh, in Scotland's history. This is a time when people are not being forced to shut down businesses merely, not being forced to mask or something like that, but where people are literally being killed for not being willing to worship according to the dictates of a king. Um, it's important we remember this uh, because it grounds us in our task as Christians and the fact that we are a church militant, that we are fighting for something always in a world that is wayward in different manners and degrees. And we shouldn't be surprised by it. In fact, I think the reason we are surprised by our current circumstances is because, honestly, it's been so long since we've had to experience anything like this. So let's jump into things. The divine right. So one theory of a sovereign's power and their right to rule is a very simple and direct authority having been bestowed upon them by God. God has somehow directly chosen the Stuart family, it would be argued, to be in charge of these three kingdoms. It's, 
It's uh, direct authority from God. And this is the sort of thing to which, you know, people will even today appeal to. I should have a gigantic Facebook post if you're really dying to read about this, this sort of stuff, about um, the nature of divine authority. But we have things like this in Romans 13, 1. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. It is a minister of God to you for good. Going to Romans uh, 13, 4 here. Um, this would seem to say that authorities are established by God. Um, it's, it's kind of this direct route. God's put them in place, and therefore you need to submit to them. And this is going to be the basic argument made by the Stuarts, by Charles II, and by his um, those who agree. You take as well, Proverbs 24, 21. My son, fear the Lord and the king. We should be a God-fearing people. We should be a king-fearing people. And it's just that simple. And if you were to represent this, of course, you have all these other scriptural, you know, statements to something like this effect. Um, it's, it's just this simple. You've got God. He appoints via his providence, his prophets, or the Pope, a king. And then that king, um, he has the right to require that a population recognize him as such. And of course, what you can see here is that since there's really only one church in the Western world who's claiming to have a living representation of God or a representative of God, the Pope, the idea of this sort of divine right of authority really works well with Roman Catholicism because the Pope is this sort of vicar of Christ on earth who can say this person is supposed to be the king. And a lot of people, if you're Roman Catholic at the time, you're going to listen to that. And so people have seen this sort of tendency in Anglicanism to push as close to Rome as you can get without actually being Roman Catholic um, to validate their right and their sort of supreme rule uh, and to be an unquestioned rule over the populace. Now, I want to put this out here too, though, and this is important to understand, increasingly in the world at this point, you are going to have more secular theories of government. Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan is really one of the main texts that's, that's going to argue for this sort of thing. Hobbes being an ag, a sort of agnostic about any personal God. He believes that there's some sort of first cause of everything. But his theory is going to say that the populace, via whether popular election, a coup, or charismatic takeover, is going to enter into some sort of social contract, something like that, with some individual who wants to be a ruler. And they're going to surrender total control to him over the state because they need to do so for security's sake. Because frankly, it's a lot easier to mobilize an army to respond to threats if you've got one central authority. But at the end of the day, it is the populace who gives authority to a king and even more developed theories of this sort of thing, like with uh, uh, John Locke and others, are going to say if the populace gives to the king his authority, then the populace can take it back but it rests all appointment of the king uh, in, into the hands of the populace. And at the end of the day, there's some sense in which God then recognizes maybe the king after the populace has so appointed him. And there really isn't any divine intervention in the placement of sovereigns over a nation at all. That's kind of the, the most secular interpretation of it. You guys see the difference between those two theories, rather stark, okay? Well, at this time, the Presbyterians are going to have as their chief apologist, uh, Samuel Rutherford, for a vision of church government that is going to prevail eventually in the world, prevail in the Americas in one manner or another, especially with re religious people. And it's articulated in his work, Lex Rex. Um, you could, a longer title would be The Law and the Prince, but it really is that the law is the prince, is what he's getting at. That the highest standard in any civil uh, society is actually going to be, um, it's going to be a constitution or a law based on uh, God's directives. And um, this is written in 1644, but here is his theory, his civil theory. Kings and sovereigns, civil governments, are in fact selected by a populace. A populace gives to a king his authority in one manner or another. But 
In so doing, it's actually the providence of God working through that populace. Um, and it's only when the populace itself is functioning with a vision of God's law undergirding their decisions and undergirding their constitution that that, that king or that sovereign has a right to rule under God. And therefore, this people also has a right of removal if that king should deviate ultimately from God's law and should deviate from the standards that God has set. Now, what would possess Samuel Rutherford to ever arrive at such a conclusion? Well, the short and straightforward answer is that this is exactly how the Bible describes the appointment of every king that we read about in the history of the nation of Israel. So here's an example. This is... In Deuteronomy 17, when God is anticipating that his people are going to have a king, would somebody like to read this? Now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on his scroll. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. And he'll go on to say several things. A king is not to multiply horses, and hence to be a military state. A king is not to multiply wives and be led astray to other gods. There are several things. But notice what's going on here. Number one... It's acknowledged that the people are going to say, I'm going to set a king over me. And then it is subsequently indicated that if you place a king over you, it needs to be a king whom the Lord your God chooses. And the generalities that God sets out there are that he has to be among your countrymen. You can't decide to have a foreigner rule over you. So Rutherford's going to say things like this. A king of a sovereign nation cannot decide to make that nation a vassal of another nation. And if he does, the people have the right to overthrow him because he is not supposed to be a king who subjects the nation again to bondage. And so they'll go, what you see here is this interface between the appointment of the people and the decision of the Lord within his perimeters and as indicated by his prophets. But at the end of the day, a king is, is appointed by the people and by the Lord and the standard by which you can determine whether he continues to have a right to rule is if he rules within the parameters that God has set for him. You guys see that? Well, this idea, and let's see, where's my bag? I don't know where I put my bag. Um, but this idea is actually all over the rest of the Bible. I didn't know I had these scriptures written down, so I'm all good. Thank you, Oggs. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. But you'll see it again and again. Judges 8, 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, both you and your son. And, the, and at the end of the day, they don't. Um, but... The picture, again, is of the people calling someone to rule. You can see this again and again and again. And even when you have kings like Saul, it says, So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. You keep reading. When David is made king, he's anointed king probably 10 years before he actually takes office. But what do we read? All these, being men of war, came to Hebron with a perfect heart to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest of Israel were of one mind to make David king. You see it again and again and again. The right of the people to make a king. And of course, with the direction of the Lord and the guidance of the Lord uh, in the parameters that we have set forth in Scripture and of course set forth by his prophets. But we have this again and again and again and again in Scripture. And you can look over these texts, but the indication that peoples, populaces, have a hand in selecting and identifying and appointing their king is a scriptural concept. And so this is what it makes for. First, God appoints a king through the consent and the election of the populace as guided by his principles in scripture, his word, okay? So it isn't as simple as God appoints the king or the populace does. God is doing this through his providence through a people. Once that's occurred on this theory, then God lays his divine law upon the king as the highest authority 
And when the king is ruling, ruling according to that law and the general equity of it, it requires recognition of that people as a minister of divine justice. That's how they're going to read Romans 13. It's how they're going to read 1 Peter 2 and these other texts. But the theory becomes more complex. So let's say that this king does cease to rule according to uh, justice and according to the parameters that God has set for him. How does the populace ever get rid of him? Well, the wrong answer would be that the populace, just by sheer rebellion and unruly coup, uh, breaks into the Capitol building wearing, uh, <laughs> wearing horns and, and no shirts, and they just take over. That's, that's just rebellion, and the Bible never really has a good take on that sort of behavior. Instead, what you have to recognize is not just the king, but the various lords beneath him, or in our case, the president and senators and congressmen and governors, all of those people are appointed uh, by the broad consent of the people. All of these people are appointed by God. The highest magistrates and the lesser magistrates. Presidents and local sheriffs. And when the local sheriff notices that the president or that the governor is imposing restrictions on, say, the First Amendment and gathering, it is the right, it is the right of a local sheriff to say, I'm not going to enforce that law because the highest law is not you. The highest law is first is the Constitution and back of it, the Lord. And so in this instance, all of these are authorities to you. Today we talk about respecting the least of authorities, not just the highest, right? All of these authorities need to be honored and respected down to the, you know, uh, the, the structure of a home and, um, of course, down to your sheriff and your policeman. And here's what's going to have to happen. If the king has gone south and maybe he's divided with half of the other sovereigns in the land, the way you need to oppose that king is not by being a crazy, riotous rabble-rouser but you need to do so by supporting the lesser magistrates over the higher magistrates. And what you need to do, therefore, is be working in, in, a, in a capacity that honors authority. Otherwise, you're just breaking the fifth commandment. Now, if you find yourself in a world where there are no lesser magistrates who are going to support your position or support uh, God's law being the highest standard, well, then you're in the position of the New Testament church and you're going to have to do your best to um, have a witness in that land and in that world. And you may be martyred. You may have to worship underground as Christians did. But ideally, you've got a situation like this. And this is what they see in situations like the English Civil War and other occasions when they had to throw off unruly authority. And of course, in the history of America, that's what they're going to argue. They're going to argue that the British crown is covenant breaking. And at the end of the day, therefore, they have a right under the banner of their government, their colonial government, to cast off the bonds of uh, authority, which they regard as tantamount to slavery. And so that's the theory. Do you guys have any uh, questions about that? Any about that vision? Why does it look like a, a yin-yang? That yeah, that's a fair question. I, I, I was looking for a division, and it's not easy to go straight across. Yeah. So that's why. Yes. Good question. Just kidding. Um, but, but no, but you see this theory, and, and notably, there are actually instances in Scripture where something very much like this occurs. So, for example, what happens when Queen Athalia says, um, I'm going to kill all the royal offspring. I'm going to be in charge. What do we read? We read that one of the princesses in Israel, um, who was married to the high priest, they hide uh, who's going to be the next king. And it says that the military commanders and the people rallied around them and they overthrew that tyrant queen. And it's presented in the most positive possible light in scripture. Likewise, what do you see when Solomon and his son Rehoboam start to impose uh, labor and taxation on the people that's tantamount to slavery? What happens? Well, God raises up Jeroboam who is clearly already a leader of the, of, uh, the, the tribe of Ephraim, um, and the other 10 tribes, they rally around him. And what do they do? They secede from uh, Judean rule. And they do so very clearly with the blessing of God. It's even spoken by a prophet to Solomon that the kingdom would be ripped from his hands, or at least the 10 tribes would. 
And so that's the theory, um, and that's the scriptural basis for it. You'd note that the one-two punch, though, for the Presbyterians is that you've got um, not only this extremely deep art and deeply argued theory by Samuel Rutherford, but you also have the concept set forth by George Gillespie, who um, was his younger compatriot, that, um, and he articulates this in Aaron's Rod Blossoming, but it's the argument that the civil magistrate is not the highest authority in the church. That is to say that the church is a totally different sphere of government that at the end of the day, the king does not rule. And so when you put those two things together, you really set forth some of the foundational ideas that, that we all have today as Americans and probably have never really even questioned or at least been forced to until times like these. But the two together were um, both of these books for the record. Every imaginable objection that you could have to the theory that I just articulated or to this theory about the church being its own government distinct from the state, these guys make the effort to answer every single one of those objections. So they're thick works to read, but um, meticulously argued, I guess you would say. All right, so let's go into the history of things with these intensely argued biblical theories behind them. We're going to go into a time where people have to really die for their belief in them. Both George Gillespie and Samuel Rutherford, advisory members of the Westminster Assembly. So very, very influential Scottish um, members of the Assembly. Um, so we, we go to Charles II. Charles II, uh, I, I, that's his reign, 1660 to 1685. He returns from Holland, his Holland exile in 1660. The people are actually begging for the king back. Many people are because Cromwell's government didn't prove to be the sort of government that they had hoped that it would be. It never blossomed quite into this grand republic that one might have liked. And so you have the Recissory Act of 1661, which basically says all of the parliamentary proceedings in the 1640s, and if you know your, your timeline well, that's when the Westminster Confession's written, all of that doesn't apply anymore. So... England is not going to become Presbyterian. They're going to continue to be Anglican. And he's supported by Anglican bishops, as you might expect, and various civil patrons. And at the end of the day, 250 Scottish ministers refuse to acknowledge the Recissory Act, and they're going to refuse to acknowledge that Charles II is the highest authority in the church. They're Presbyterian. They embrace the Westminster standards. They've had a Church of Scotland for a, well into the century prior to this one, and they're not going to become Anglican overnight. So 250 Scottish ministers refuse, and they are virtually going to be um, at the heart of a military conflict as things um, unfold. Uh, in 1662, you have the Act of Uniformity, and this uh, is the beginning of the Great Ejection, where some 2,500 Puritan ministers are ousted from their pulpits, ousted from their churches. They are not allowed to actually come within a certain distance of these churches, something like a restraining order on them. And so 2,500 ministers, that's a lot of ministers who had their own distinct congregations. And this is all done of all dates on August 24th, which was the same date in the uh, same day of the year in the previous century when the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre had occurred in France and the various uh, Reformed Protestants in France were killed by the 10,000s. Um, and so this is a rather symbolic day to um, have the Act of Uniformity declared and passed. And so the this is going to be the beginning of a major conflict um, on both sides of the, the English and Scottish border, but especially as we're going to see in, um, in Scotland. Um, this, is, this is, I'm trying to think if you can see, yeah, so a list of the various um, ministers, some of the more famous ones who were ejected from their pulpits. So you'd see uh, Richard Baxter uh, is a more common name, Ralph Venning, a more common na name. Ralph Venning wrote in 1669, The Plague of Plagues, where he, it, while this is going on, you, you should note that the bubonic plague is also occurring. So you, you have civil war, you have bubonic plague, 
and he writes a book called The Plague of Plagues, arguing that the greatest plague in the world is sin, not the, not the plague that, that everyone's worried about. Again, this is rather shaping for, for folks like us. In our world, people being as fearful as they are of coronavirus, well, the plague is literally something that is killing, you know, one in three people. And a minister is writing something to the effect that the real problem is sin. Imagine trying to say that to our world today with just the frenzy that people are in right now. Um, but this is what's going on in England. And this is, you know, the Puritans are going to write voluminously in this time. Incredible, incredible things amidst civil war, amidst conflict, amidst illness. But there is a brief period where for whatever reason, and uh, historians debate why, they call it the blink. It's a brief period between 1669 and 1672 where it's as if Charles is like, I'm going to try benevolence. I'm going to try to be conciliatory. And basically, he it's the Declaration of Indulgement, Indulgence that says to ministers, you can be reinstated. You, you've just got to acknowledge me as the head of the church. And why is that so hard? And even in Scotland, you know, you can be placed back in your pulpits. You know, everyone can be regarded by me as a legitimate minister, but you've got to just embrace this tiny hint of Erastianism, Erastian theory being that the civil power has ultimate authority over the church. Just acknowledge it. I'll otherwise allow you to maybe worship in a style that is not entirely conformed to the Book of, church, uh, Book of Common Prayer and things like that. Well, this is the time when the Reformed Presbyterians, as a distinct branch of Presbyterians, uh, begins to form. Back in 1638, when this business was attempted with Charles I, prior to the Westminster Assembly, uh, you already had a time when the Covenanters covenanted together that they would go to war if there was hostility from England toward their church. Well, the Reformed Presbyterians are those who said, we made a covenant back in 1638, and we're not breaking it. We're sticking with it. If someone tries to uh, be the head and the authority over our church and our worship, we're not going to let that happen. And this is when people begin meeting in conventicles. A conventicle essentially means a meeting without doors. So you're meeting outside, meeting in barns, meeting in boat factories with big hangar doors open, I guess. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. But this is strictly illegal. You're not to worship in any fashion in this land, but that which acknowledges Charles as the head of the church. And so begins after this brief blink, uh, the killing time, 1679 to 1688, this roughly 10 year period uh, is marked by several turning points, but the disruption at Rutherglen is one of them. Uh, the, the main instigator, the individual who is sent to uphold in Southwest Scotland, the king's vision of religion was John Graham of Claver House, and they called him Bloody Claver. And uh, he, um, at this disruption, people are declaring that they are not going to conform. They are uh, rejecting the uh, Charles's decrees. What did we call that again? It was the um, Act of Uniformity. And they're, they're burning uh, copies of it as an act of protest. Well, what this leads to is the Battle of Bothwell Bridge uh, nearby. Um, Ruther Glen is where this is happening generally. Bothwell Bridge is outside of Glasgow. And um, what you end up having at this battle at the bridge, um, obviously many, many casualties of war, but at the end of it, two ministers are executed. Five covenanters are executed. And um, 1,200 people are enslaved literally uh, sold into slavery. Remember we saw that um, uh, John Knox was a galley slave on a, on a boat. And that was something that you would do uh, when, when a war has occurred. And um, so you have a monument. This is a monument to Bothwell Bridge um, from 16, yeah, exactly. It's, it has the commemorative date there, June 1679. And this is just one conflict uh, very near the beginning of this killing time, 1679. Well, it's not the end of it. Then you have the Queen's Ferry paper. Uh, two men, Henry Hall and David Cargill, both covenanters, both uh, men who are going to stand against 
any attempt of the civil government to rule the church, they articulate their ideas in eight points in what is called the Queen's Ferry Paper. And these men are apprehended, and this manifesto is found on them. It's about 6,000 words, and one-third of it is just is, uh, outrightly anti-monarchy. This is going to go a step further than that the king is not the sovereign ruler of the church. It's actually going to say there should be no royal family at all. Now, this is a pretty salacious idea at the time. There should be no, we, we shouldn't be functioning according to a, a monarchy. We should be functioning according to an entirely different form of government. That, of course, would be seen by the king as highly problematic. It also, in its points, articulates an idea that is probably more common among Presbyterians than any other denomination around. A minister needs to be educated and trained for his task. They remember the days, or at least it hasn't been long since you have priests who've never maybe read the scriptures in their own language. They're determined that we will never be back there again. We need to have a trained clergy. They need to know Hebrew and Greek. They need to know the history of the church. They need to know their theology. They need to know their doctrine. But this creates a rather challenging thing for this people. Because here's the thing, when the world is at war, when uh, your particular theological perspective is not prevailing in the schools of Cambridge and Oxford, or even a legal teaching in uh, Edinburgh or St. Andrews or these other uh, hubs of education, how are you gonna train your ministers to, 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 to be ministers? And if no one should be a minister but a trained man, well, guess what the authorities figure out? We need to kill all your ministers. And that's it's a fairly natural conclusion to draw if you want to root this out. What's going to happen in the course of time, as you're going to see, is they actually kill so many ministers that it becomes common for the covenanters to meet in homes and simply read sermons from old ministers because they won't have an untrained minister over them. That really raises a challenging question about what should be done in an extreme circumstance. In any case, Richard Cameron uh, is going to be one of these sorts of uh, ministers. And frankly, these guys, are they're all risking their life to be doing what they're doing. And he's something of, of a military leader at the same time with bands of people gathered around him. And... Um, What's going to happen is he is going to be responsible for the Sankohar Declaration. It's another sort of thing like the Queen's Fairy Paper, some sort of manifesto declaring and expounding a vision of the world that is very different. And um, the Camerons are both, um, he and his brother, uh, they're both leaders in this movement. And at Sankohar, he is going to actually call the people to war to fight off and to um, fight against these encroaching powers of the monarchy. And when, when, when these th sorts of things occur, it, what it's going to result in is that he's going to die. He ends up dying. He, he dies uh, along with several others. And frankly, regular people are, end, up, end up getting sucked into this as well. So here's a, a classic representation of, of Margaret Wilson. She's martyred in 1685 because she refuses to, to renounce the covenant, the national covenant to be a Presbyterian church and to not acknowledge the right of the king over the church. And the way she's killed is she's tied to a pole out in the sea. And as the tide goes up, she's drowned in the sea. And um, the death toll within 10 years is 18,000 people. That's you know the, the conservative estimate of how many people were killed for their faith in the course of 10 years. At one point, eventually, James Renwick is the only Covenanter pastor in all of Scotland. So that's the situation you're in. You've got one guy in the entire country, and he's eventually martyred in 1688. So what do you do if you're a Covenanter? You don't have any pastors. Um, the, the denomination in our country today that is the descendants of the, the Covenanters is the RPCNA. It's a, a much smaller uh, Presbyterian denomination. They actually had similar struggles early in the, their time in the Americas when they came over not having a trained pastor who was specifically a covenanter. And for years, they would do the same sort of thing. Their worship would consist of house meetings 
and reading a sermon from some, you know, uh, some covenanter or Puritan who, um, who was a trained pastor. And that um, you'd consider them to be the most, I guess you would say, hardcore among um, the Scottish Presbyterians. <laughs> They're not budging. And let's face it, they died for this, man. I mean, they died in droves. And you can kind of understand how they got where they were. Um, does anyone have any question about this time period in, in Presbyterian history? Yeah. Yeah, RPCN is actually really big in Kansas, too. I, I'm aware of that much, at least. Um, some of the cool things about them in American history is they actually had the boldest stance of all Presbyterians against slavery. They j pretty much, from the get-go, were abolitionists in, in, in their vision of things that, that it needed to end. But see, what's, so they've, they've always been politically involved in ways that some other denominations are not. On the other hand... They really, really, really got behind prohibition, too. Um, the staunch prohibitionists. And if you know anything about that movement, um, Mid-America, Kansas, I mean, that's like the heart of prohibitionism. And they've, they've since kind of walked that back as a denomination. So, you know, I think that's kind of the, the challenge of involvement in things political. You know, you have some good things on your rap sheet, and you probably have some things where you're like, I, I don't know if I'm totally proud of that, you know? But go ahead. Was John Brown in the Presbyterian history? The bra like the brownest? Well, Kansas, like Kansas, uh, uh, his, his initial involvement in, in trying to provoke a civil war about slavery. Yeah, no, that I don't know. That's a good question. I, I don't, I, I, I would doubt it though, because in general, in general, Presbyterians were incrementalists. It generally, we're opting for a slower manu process of manumission. Oh, and, but I should be clear, there were definitely ones who weren't. But um, they tended to be in the North and part of the New School, and we'll talk about them. But that said, the end of this nasty time period, there, there is a brief period in between where Charles is succeeded by um, another Stuart monarch who's not particular, what, James II, I believe, um, who kind of carries on, you know, the tradition of just asserting the right of the crown. But where things really get worked out for everyone is when William and Mary, um, they, they take the throne. And it, William and Mary are actually first cousins, hence this family tree. That is to say, they have the same grandparents, which is Charles I and uh, Henri uh, Henrietta Maria. Um, but they, they are first cousins to one another. And so this is uh, one of those things about the lines of consanguinity that um, would be have been much more common in, in that world, and especially when it comes to royal blood, because in general you had um, less suitors to, uh, to choose from. But what's going to happen is they call this the Glorious Revolution. William and Mary, they are first cousins, but they are Protestants, and they are responsible for the Act of Toleration in 1689. Toleration of nonconformists. What does that mean in England? Well, it means the Puritans uh, can worship in some form or fashion without doing so in hiding. Um, it actually asserts limits on the monar monarchy's rights over religion. There is still a state church. There's still an Anglican church. But by allowing other people to practice a religion or to pr practice their, you should say, interpretation of Christianity uh, without legal um, repercussions, that's going to really limit the monarchy's power because they're not the head of the only Christian church in existence that's acknowledged and allowed to exist. And uh, the Westminster Standards, they are, a, you can, basically the Scottish church can embrace them. They don't have to become Anglican um, and they don't even have to become mildly Erastian acknowledging Charles's right over them. It's allowed to exist as its own Presbyterian church. So, Here's the thing, guys. People died. Blood was shed. But this is the sort of picture of the first resurrection that a post-millennialist is going to embrace. It's the idea that one generation dies, passes away, but what, how is it met by God? It's met by God with fruits in society, fruits in the world, and a generation that gets to stand on their shoulders and be their spiritual descendants blessed by the sacrifice that they have made. And so it's the sort of picture of like 
you know, you, you do have sort of a boon in this time for um, these traditions that had suffered so much. They get to come back to life and back out into the open, you could say. It's like a valley of dry bones being allowed to, you know, resurrect and walk around and, and be a people. And so your problems after 1689 for religion are in, in, in the UK or uh, in Britain is going to be very different than what they were before. The new enemies you're going to see in the Enlightenment are of other systems of thought, secularism, more than they are um, the attempt at totalitarian rule or even just a general rule of the church by the civil government. Any questions for me on that idea? 1688 to 1702. So going into the 1700s, there's going to increasingly be a different view of how the church relates to the state, and it's going to affect everything in the course of time. Um, this is a, po a, a picture of the landing of William of Orange in 1688. Um, he is welcomed by the people of um, England, and they are ecstatic to have what they anticipate to be a very different sort of reign than what you had by um, Charles II and uh, James II. And you can imagine it was a rather bright day for people who had been worshiping in secret and underground and in barns and all those sorts of things. But this takes us to considering uh, religion in the Americas now. Um, notice all of that business we were talking about, Charles II, you know, William and Mary, all of that, um, we're going to have to go back in time now to James I. James I, you might recall, was instrumental in calling the Synod of Dort in Holland. He pressured um, the Dutch government to, to have a synod talking about Calvinism. Uh, I've told you that his rep sheet is pretty good for, <laughs> for what he's done. I mean, he has some pretty amazing accomplishments. He's going to be responsible for the first settlement in the Americas by any sort of uh, English contingency of people. Uh, you've got the King James Bible, and you've got the Synod of Dort uh, on your calendar, on your, your watch. So that's pretty impressive. And you'll note that while this craziness is going on in Scotland and in England, America is just getting underway. And you can start to understand why this would be such an appealing place to go if you were a Puritan. Because you're dying in droves in this period if you're under Charles II. And you'll note that it's really going to be, I mean, in this era in America, just tens of thousands of uh, Puritan Reformed people are going to end up on the North American continent. So again, you see another way that in God's providence, the Lord is working something for his people that you never maybe could have known was even going on if you were just in the heat of the battle of the killing time in Scotland. What he's actually doing is he is forming a new land, the Lord is, and um, that's what's happening um, in this time period in history. So we'll, we'll start in 1620 and begin to get uh, a taste of early Christianity in America. And the two by far most influential uh, religious leaders at the time were um, two men who were related, Increase and Cotton Mather, Increase the father, Cotton his son. And um, look at the lifespan of Increase Mather, 1639 to 1723, so we're talking about a man who makes it some 84 years uh, in a time period when a lot of people didn't live. To, well, a lot of people died before they were 20. A lot of people would die when they were 50. This man really lives out the first century on this continent. He's one of the, the great religious leaders of the time. I'll note our next lecture, I will talk about Jonathan Edwards in great depth. He'll we'll basically survey the whole of his life and get a sense of what the Great Awakening was. But we're going to talk about the time before that in brief here today. So Christianity in America, it begins with um, really efforts at um, colonization and efforts at business in America that um, basically sovereigns and kings and rulers had to be behind because to actually get a ship to go over there with proper supplies and all that was needed, you, you had to have a government backing you. Uh, it wasn't like you could just jump in a boat and go to the Americas. Well, King James I, during the Age of Exploration, understands the incredible value of this continent um, across the Atlantic. 
And so the first settlement in America is actually in Virginia, Jamestown, Virginia. And it's actually a fort. Um, obviously, they, they knew that there were potential hostels in the land. There were natives. Um, so it is built as a fort. And Virginia is actually named after Elizabeth the first, the, the virgin queen. She never married. And that's where Virginia gets its name from. So the earliest religion to be manifested on the American continent um, by the English is going to be Anglicanism. Um, of course, in, uh, in the South, in Central America, and even in the South of the United States, Florida and that region, Roman Catholics actually got there even before these guys did. But this is going to be the beginning of understanding American religion. It's all going to be the fruit of the Reformed tradition in one way or another. It's going to be Anglican, or it's going to be Congregational, and then in the course of time, it's going to be there are going to be Presbyterians as well, as we will see. But if you know anything about Jamestown, it was something of a failure. Um, it, they didn't really take root there as a population, as a society. Um, they fell in some really hard times shortly into their existence. And so Jamestown is not what you would consider to be the center of America or the beginning of um, American anything, really. What you tend to think of, rather, are the pilgrims uh, in, in New England, right? Landing on Plymouth Rock. Um, you got to understand something about the pilgrims. They are a subset of what you would consider Puritan. They are more radical Puritans. Puritans want to purify the church. They actually, uh, they want for there to be a state church. They just want that the state recognize religion to be um, either Presbyterian or Congregational in one way or another. Well, Robert Brown, um, he is uh, the beginning of what they would call the Brownists. And they have a more radical vision of things. They want a clean break uh, between church and state. They don't want to have a Presbytery per se. In fact, they don't even need to have a trained uh, uh, or ordained uh, trained clergy. Um, the Brownists, in fact, their leaders would eventually include some who were, were not necessarily trained. And they end up in, in Leiden, which is in Holland, okay? So that's where you generally go if you were a refugee. And the Brownists tended to attract um, more blue-collar folk. Puritans, were, are, they're pretty heady. When you, when you read Puritan works, these guys are clearly trained theologians. Well, the pilgrims don't necessarily require that same high bar of education and things. And a lot of the Brownists, um, in addition to being frustrated about freedom of religion and their desire to worship uh, as they understand the scriptures to teach them to, they also are just sick and tired of the, um, the sort of life that you would have to live if you were a lower class citizen. You didn't really have any mobility to make more money. You didn't ever have any mobility to own anything. And so the, the pilgrims were a more scrappy group in some ways than even uh, the Puritans. And so from August to November, 1620, that is when uh, they're going to make their way to America. 45 of those um, on their ship, uh, 45 of them died of 102. So basically half of the people there. So mothers, uh, in particular, uh, the big death toll on mothers. And the thought is, is because they would give whatever they had to their, their children and um, really fight for the lives of, of their kids. And at the end of the day, William Bradford is going to become one of the early leaders of this group. And upon arrival in the Americas, they set up the first colony, which is going to be the Plymouth Colony, which is kind of that, you know, uh, hook of Massachusetts. Uh, but the colony that is going to grow in droves is actually the Massachusetts Bay Colony up above them. And that's because from 1630 to 1643, you have a mass Puritan migration of at least 20,000 Puritans who end up in New England. So pretty massive numbers of people who are seeking out religious freedom in this new land. And you're going to continue to see this influx, especially until the Glorious Revolution and the Act of Toleration, but that's not even until 1689, right? So that's a lot of years for people to wake up, smell the coffee, and say, there's a place I can go where I can 
A, maybe like own land, maybe have a totally different life, a much better life than we currently have, a life where we can worship according to the scriptures, and we're not dealing with any of this mess. It's, uh, it's a pretty appealing thing in spite of the fact that the voyage ha- had a huge risk, a huge death toll potentially, and being there had all sorts of unanswered questions. How you're going to eat, how you're going to live, Um, without any broader civilization around you to catch you as a net. So yeah, it took a great deal of bravery, but you know, this is one picture representation of folks coming over to New England at that time period. And so what I want to show you is what happens in the course of time. This is quite a bit later, 1750, but I want to give you a sense of what the American Americas are like. Anglican, we saw in Virginia, the first settlements were Anglican, and Anglicanism actually is, is going to be, in the first 100 years of America, um, one of the most common religions that you're going to see are common denominations of Christianity. But here's the thing, the most populated regions by far, and the heart of America, you would say at this time, you know, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New England, is congregational. What does that mean? Well, it means that they uh, adopt the Westminster Confession as their statement of theology. Uh, and I've told you that like the Westminster Shorter Catechism was the most printed document in the world because of that. Um, but they were not Presbyterian. They believed that each individual congregation had a sufficient um, government in itself. And beyond that, they actually recognized the civil government as having a hand in religion. So the civil government would say, for example, pay ministers. So your Uh, your payment to your minister would come out of your taxes. And they would also help to raise funds uh, to build a church. And so congregationalism is still very much reliant on the civil government to exist and to function. And if there was a big dispute in a church, you could form, you know, maybe some committee of other other ministers locally, a a makeshift sort of committee. But at the end of the day, um, the decision to uh, retain a pastor, to get rid of a pastor, it's going to uh, fall into the hands of a congregation. And you can actually understand why, why congregationalism would have been fairly natural in the Americas. Number one, to have a presbytery, what do you have to have? You have to have multiple churches. Well, you looked at that first group that, you know, they were pilgrims, but half of them died on the way over. And it's just, you're, everything you did, you kind of had to do together. That's what it's like in moments of utter austerity. So it's not surprising that you would have a lot more like, all right, we got to have a group discussion. How many families we got here? Okay, we got this many. This is life and death, so we got to figure out what we're going to do to survive. And so it's not surprising that congregationalism would have, um, it'd be a natural way for the cookie to crumble, you might say, even if it isn't the ideal way for a church to be governed. There are inroads of Lutheranism in in this time period. The massive influx of, of German Americans is not going to happen in the first 100 years. But there are small Presbyterian dots on this. South Carolina down here, we'll see um, in coming lectures. That was a place where some Reformed people, both from France and Presbyterians from uh, North Ireland and Scotland, will end up. Uh, Delaware is actually a, a pretty big Presbyterian center when things get started. Maryland and, of course, Pennsylvania uh, in New Jersey. This is, they're considered the, the middle colonies, and that's where Presbyterianism is going to be the strongest. At the end of the day, they're going to grow in this region by picking off Congregationalists who, well, they already believe in the Westminster Confession and, um, uh, you know, already had leanings in that direction, perhaps. But this is what America is going to look like, and I just want to point out a few things to anticipate our coming lectures as I go through the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries um, in, in America. I want to show you something. If you took the original 13 colonies, every single one of them, with the exception of a couple, have an established religion. That is to say, a religion that if you're going to live in this state, you can maybe worship according to another another tradition. But if you want to run for office, and if you want to have any sort of uh, control in this, this state, you're going to have to be an an advocate of this. So Virginia, not surprisingly, Anglicanism, as we saw. Um, New York had an established religion, Anglican. Massachusetts, not surprisingly, congregational. Maryland, Anglican, Delaware actually had none. So that's one of the, the, that and Rhode Island, 
are going to be the couple that have none. Pennsylvania, also very early on, um, religious freedom. But you'll note, most states of the original 13 colonies had established state churches. And in fact, that support doesn't go away and for most, some of them in, into the 1800s. This is actually important to note because when you read about, you know, the disestablishment of religion in the federal government in our founding documents, that, was, that is to say that there's to be a separation between any church sect and the state. They were saying that because they were saying the federal government to be newly established was not supposed to have a state religion so as to overthrow the selected state churches in the original 13 colonies. Although all of them, it would have been clear that you, you functionally couldn't have power if you were not Christian, um, broadly speaking. So even in these states that uh, don't require you to be you know, uh, congregational, you will find in their state um, constitutions that you must be Trinitarian as opposed to Unitarian or as opposed to agnostic or any of these other things. You don't ever hear about this, do you, right? You'd never know that this was the case in, in, uh, in the Americas early on. It's, I mean, look at this. Not until 16, uh, rather 1868 does South Carolina eventually have, you know, the disestablishment of any particular church in that state. And usually the reason why is, is not because they want to be out and out secularists. It's because they want for other Christians of other denominations to be able to run for office. And that's how we have things changing. So is that surprising or what? Huh? <laughs> not at all. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this basic picture of things? Yeah, so they're saying... <laughs> so. Christian would mean that, um, broadly speaking, you've got to, you've got to be Christian. Uh, you could even be Roman Catholic. But they're saying not uh, that we have questions about being Roman Catholic. And so even if it's written into their founding documents that you're not going to be able to be an officer here. They see it as, in some ways, a threat to their existence if you're Roman Catholic in attempting to occupy office. But, yeah, so, so they specify Protestant. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about um, what happens early on in America. One of the earliest religious institutions is Harvard in Massachusetts Bay Colony. Why does it exist? For the training of ministers. Puritans see it as important. It doesn't happen in Plymouth Colony. Remember, they're pilgrims. Not quite as concerned about that. They are concerned about that when you're Puritans. All of the original um, Ivy League schools in our country began as uh, training grounds for ministers because that was seen as essential. But the thing is, very, very shortly, within a generation, 30 to 40 years, these institutions of higher learning are falling prey to Unitarianism and to deism and to uh, the big ideas at the time. If you know anything about the Enlightenment and you know anything about the modern period in philosophy, this is when more secular views of reality start to take root that are neither Roman Catholic nor Protestant. And when people started getting involved in higher learning and reading the most provocative thoughts and theories of the day, secularism became increasingly common. And so to be honest with you, rather shortly in the Americas, there's rather vast religious decline. That's why you're gonna have something called the Great Awakening. But you have to understand that um, the other thing about it is this. People who have never had, for maybe generations and generations, an opportunity to make money, to be somewhat prosperous, are for the first time discovering a sort of prosperity that people didn't think was even possible. And the minute when people get comfortable, you know, they're not fighting for their religion or their church anymore. And... They, they are um, being exposed to new ideas. Education is becoming a more prominent thing in general. Um, you begin to see incredible religious decline in the Americas at this, at this time. And, um, you know, here's the thing about it. A good way to, a good lens through which to see what's happening in America really are the Salem witch trials. You know, in a world that's becoming increasingly rationalistic and increasingly naturalistic in its view of things, denying the supernatural, 
there is actually a cultural reaction to that rationalism, which was not toward Christianity, but toward superstition in general, toward this sort of occult vision of the world. Even in England, Joseph Glanville had written against modern Sadduceeism. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection, don't believe in angels, don't believe in a soul. And it was seen as a very naturalistic view of things. And Joseph Glanville wrote against this tendency that was increasing even in the 1600s um, throughout the world and throughout England. But people who were reacting to rationalism were not necessarily racing to Christianity. Many of them were racing to um, experimentation with all sorts of different pagan practices, occult practices. In fact, you know, in a world where there's a toleration for a broad range of religious conviction and belief, some people are thinking, why not explore any and every type of spirituality that's available? And so Cotton Mather, you might recall, son of Increase Mather, he writes uh, The Wonders of the Invisible World. And you'll note that there is a very, very strong emphasis among men like Cotton and Increase Mather on the reality of a spiritual realm, the reality of demonic influences. And frankly, when you're in a new world with native populations around you that are worshiping in ways that are totally bizarre to you, strange and even a bit scary, you can imagine why people would be a bit spooked living in this new land. You're hearing sounds out there. Civilization is far, far, far away. It's an Atlantic Ocean away. And people are increasingly, you might say, maybe spiritual and superstitious, but not necessarily Christian. In fact, in Wonders of the Invisible World, this is actually going to be Cotton Mather's apology for what's going to happen in Salem with the witch trials. Um, out of this reaction to rationalism, you have this kind of dangerous spiritualism. And if you know anything about the, the witch trials, in short, a handful of young ladies begin manifesting behaviors that seem to be what demonic possession is described as in the Bible. Screeches, screams, convulsions. And what they say is the reason this is happening is because three specific women in this town of Salem are witches and they've hexed them. And what's their proof? Well, look at us. We're crazy. We're flailing around. We're insane. And this begins um, a, a series of trials. And the problem is, is that one of the three women who was um, a slave of African descent, she actually admitted to being a witch. Now, whether she actually was or wasn't, whether she said it because she thought maybe by admitting it and then turning around and was she pressured? Who knows? But that just be began a fire of hundreds of accusations uh, eventually in the course of time over a period of roughly two years. Um, and in the course of which, 20 people um, are executed, the majority of them women, three-fourths of them women, um, being accused of being, uh, of being witches. Now think about this, though. You're accusing someone of being a witch because you're manifesting signs of demonic possession. That's a rather dangerous place to be uh, if, if I can manifest a behavior which is taken as proof that you are meddling in the black arts, right? Um, and so this is the sort of thing, this is the problem with it, and it goes to this question of the danger posed versus how compelling the evidence is. Here's the thing. When we think something is so incredibly dangerous that because of the magnitude of danger posed by it, we can lower the bar of evidence for proof that it really is the said danger, we get in a really problematic place, don't we? Um, you know, you, you might ask, you know, in any given time when something is set forth as a killer, as a, something that could harm people, and it's, it's magnified how problematic it can be, you actually see people's bar for how much evidence you need to support that claim drop because the potential danger posed is thought to be so high. So you think about the Red Scare in, you know, Hollywood. You know, they're communists. Well, it's just so dangerous that we might have communists infiltrating this powerful medium of propaganda that the evidence doesn't even have to be that high because the potential danger is enough to go, yeah, well, it's not that big of a deal to lose an actor in Hollywood. Well, here's the thing. When you're really thinking 
that these dangers are this serious, that maybe it will be a continent overrun by demonic activity, uh, the bar, unfortunately, for the public dropped dramatically. And I think this inevitably affected the civil magistrates as well. When you see an angry mob outside of a courthouse in a trial who are convinced that these ladies are, are witches, one even admitted it, it's going to be hard to rule objectively, like we read about in Leviticus 19 today, and to not show partiality. So 20 are executed, hundreds are accused, and you have this quote by Increase Mather. He says, this is the father. Increase says, it were better that 10 suspected witches should escape than that one innocent person should be condemned. That's a pretty principled stance to have on it. In fact, some people have argued that Increase and Cotton were at odds in their view of the witch trials. But in fact, even though he said this, they both kind of turn around, and especially Cotton turns around and says, yes, we need to make sure we have high standards of evidence. We cannot allow uh, mere signs of demonic activity to be sufficient to condemn another person. But he actually goes on to argue, as for those who we did execute, the evidence was actually pretty strong. They would say we found in their houses uh, figurines and dolls with uh, needles in them, which, you know, it's a voodoo doll, you know, meant to afflict. It's some sort of tool or implement to make this happen. But at the end of the day, most people were agreed, including the Mathers, that something in the way of the bar of evidence had been dropped dramatically, and it's regarded as one of the more shameful period, uh, events of the time. But see, this is what happens, you could argue, when people lose Christian principles of morality, but retain a belief in spirituality, the supernatural, demons, angels, and you name it, people end up in a frenzy. And that was increasingly the sort of picture of the world at that time. People don't realize that during the Enlightenment, that's when you have all these secret societies, from the Rosicrucians to the uh, you know, um, precursors to what we call the Masons today, these secret societies who are dabbling in alchemy and all sorts of different things. And it's undeniable that in the world, as freedom of religion, or you might say, would we the act of toleration, you know, these things occur, it doesn't just open the door for Christians to worship according to their conviction. It actually kind of opens the door for all sorts of things to be published in the world that are of, of dubious character in terms of uh, just the vision of spirituality that they have and not being guided by scripture. And as we'll see in the course of time, in America, there has to be a great awakening to um, what the Puritans had fought for in the first place, which is the gospel. Um, so that's a picture of things, a picture of the first hundred years in America. And I'll just set this out here. You know, Benjamin Franklin, who's going to be a, a pretty major figure going into the 18th century, um, he described this situation. He said this, um, this is cotton matter. He says, religion brought forth prosperity and the daughter destroyed the mother. You know, this is religion compelled people to the Americas. But very shortly, that prosperity that she birthed became the more powerful principle in this land. And listen to what Benjamin Franklin said. Mather, both Mathers were known to be very powerful communicators and preachers. And Franklin says, Mather preached, but no one listened. But Mather just kept preaching. And this is an important thing for us to, to take with us as well. You know, as we look at the current age in which we live, you know, it's prosperity at the end of the day that fuels the insane sorts of directions that we're going with the idea you can change your gender or the idea that, you know, maybe we should just legalize all substances. And these, you know, you can live in, when, when the world is sufficiently prosperous, you can engage all sorts of insane ideas. But when you see the effects of those policies and what that does to a populace in general, um, you know, then prosperity starts to, to wane and, and you have to start dealing with the problem. What the church needs to do is keep preaching throughout all of that. You know, we are not going to suspend our witness based on whether or not, um, you know, religion is waning or wheeling. It's not the ultimate impetus of things for us. And I think that's a great testament to what the Mathers were doing.
we'll talk about you know the the, the great turnaround um, in the late um, in the later years there. But does anyone have any questions for me about uh, just this initial imprint of, of Christianity in America? No. Broadly speaking, chapter you read? No. All right. Well, we close there with uh, with this. Next time we meet, we're going to talk all about Jonathan Edwards and the Great Awakening. So look forward to seeing you guys. Have a blessed day. Get some good rest.